Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. So, still one of the most controversial areas that we deal with on the endocrine and nuclear medicine side of thyroid cancer is whether or not to use radioactive iodine. Because it just makes sense that radioactive iodine should help. My patients, I tell them that this is a heat-seeking missile. You swallow it, it goes everywhere through your body, and it finds those little thyroid cancer places and it destroys them. So physicians and patients and everybody, it just makes sense. If I do that, you would do better. And it turns out that's just not the case. There are many low-risk patients that just do not need radioactive iodine. They already have a 1% chance of recurrence. With radioactive iodine, I can't make it zero. It's still 1%. So what we've seen over the course of the last really 10 years is a much more risk stratified approach to the use of radioactive iodine. We're in high risk patients, big tumors, distant metastasis, lots of lymph node metastasis. Everybody would treat with radioactive iodine. In the really low risk patients, less than a centimeter confined to the thyroid, most people would not use radioactive iodine. And that leaves most of our patients in the middle. And when I look at those patients in the middle, I do look at their continuum of risk. If I think you're on the low side of risk and you're likely to recur in the neck where I can find that really easily, then you don't have to have radioactive iodine right up front. If I think you're on the higher side of risk where you've got a 20 or 30% chance of recurrence, or if you have a specific tumor like a follicular cancer or a Herthel cell cancer, that that recurrence might be in the lungs or the bone, so I'm not gonna be able to find it with my follow-up ultrasound then I might choose to do radioactive iodine in that patient. The other piece to radioactive iodine is, in addition to decreasing recurrence, it does help with staging. Um, that when you give somebody radioactive iodine, you get a head-to-toe, whole-body radioactive iodine scan that patients find very reassuring, doctors find reassuring. So when we talk about this role of radioactive iodine, not very much in low risk, definitely in the high risk, and in the intermediate risk patients, you have to decide what do you think the risk of recurrence is and do you need it to help with your staging and follow-up. And then obviously the patients get a vote in this. Um, there are some patients that say, don't give it to me unless you're certain it's going to help me. Other patients say, if there's the least chance this is going to help me, give it to me. And so that definitely uh, plays into whether or not we use it. And then finally, the last piece has to do with how we do follow-up. Um, I have wonderful ultrasonographers. We've got a very, very fancy serum thyroglobulin test that reads very, very low. So I don't necessarily need to give radioactive iodine to be able to do follow-up. In other centers around the country and around the world, they don't have such wonderful ultrasonographers. They may not have easy access to these very nice thyroglobulin assays. And so they rely a little bit more on the radioactive iodine ablation to help them with staging and follow-up. So there's a variety of factors that help me decide whether or not for you as an individual person we should do radioactive iodine that go beyond the pathology report, go beyond the risk factors, and into sort of your personal preference, my personal preference, and how we do long-term follow-up. So one of the most difficult management decisions I do every week in the office is trying to help a patient that has distant metastasis decide whether or not we're done with radioactive iodine because in so many patients with distant metastasis, radioactive iodine is a terrific therapy. It holds the disease, it shrinks the disease. And so before we move on to any of these other newer agents that often work quite well, we need to be certain that we're done with radioactive iodine. The buzzword for this this day is making sure the patient's REI refractory. That's a lot easier to write than it is to tell in person. Um, many times it's difficult to know. Sometimes it's easy that they have metastatic disease in the lungs or the bones, they've had a dose of radioactive iodine and the tumor does not grab onto radioactive iodine at all when I do the pictures. That's easy, that's REI refractory. Most of the time it's not that clean. They pick up a little bit of radioactive iodine or one place is pick up radioactive iodine, another place doesn't. So then what I'm trying to do is decide whether or not the last dose of radioactive iodine helped me. Did I get a treatment response from the last dose of radioactive iodine? If I did, I'm willing to give another dose. If I didn't, then we're probably done with it. There are other sort of surrogate markers that help me. Uh, patients that are very positive on FDG PET scanning, very unlikely to concentrate radioactive iodine, so they're probably REI refractory. 
Uh, the histologies help me, poorly differentiated tumors, very aggressive tumors, also very unlikely to be REI refractory. So I think it's a combination of using the scans to look and say, is there an REI avid disease on there? Asking how well did my last dose of radioactive iodine work? Um, and then with those sort of couple factors, that lets us figure out whether or not we're done with radioactive iodine or there's room to add some more in. We use some uh, standard definitions for defining radioactive iodine refractory disease. Uh, these primarily are utilized in clinical trials uh, for clinical research purposes to have a rigid and uniform definition for what qualifies as radioactive iodine refractory disease. These include three points. So primarily the first one is if patients have known metastatic disease that does not take up radioactive iodine on a whole body iodine scan. If they've been treated with radioactive iodine and have developed disease progression within a year of the last radioactive iodine treatment, or if they've been treated with a cumulative dose of 600 millicuries of radioactive iodine. Uh, if they meet any of those criteria, we consider the patient to be uh, refractory to radioactive iodine therapy. Of course, these are not uh, completely hard and fast, rigid criteria. Um, sometimes we have patients that technically meet one of those criteria, but as a tumor board, we still feel that the patient may benefit from additional treatment with radioactive iodine therapy. In other cases, we've had patients who do not meet any of those criteria, but based on a variety of reasons, whether it be uh, the, the disease burden, if they have really extensive bulky disease, if they have tumor histologies that are less likely to be radioiodine avid, and if they've had a PET CT scan that shows um, strongly FDG avid tumor metastases, sometimes the tumor board will uh, make the decision that that patient is not a good candidate for further radioactive iodine therapy. Those are typically the situations in which we would make a decision to switch therapy from radioactive iodine to an oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor.